mute your microphones, that would be really helpful. Um, and you can keep your video on or you can keep it off. Um, but if you have a question, we're going to have some time at the end for questions. And um, you can interrupt as well. But if you want to hold your questions, you can turn your mic off on at the end and ask any questions. So welcome to the Burlington County Bar Association seminar today. This is the importance of succession planning for your practice, what every attorney needs to know. Um, we have an amazing panel here today. Um, before I introduce everyone, just make sure that you stay on for the entire program. At the end, I'll be reading you a code, which you'll need for your CLE credits. And um, please just make sure to send that uh, code back as well with your evaluation form. So today we have the Honorable Ronald E. Bookbinder, who is, everyone knows, um, is uh, was appointed in 1990 and it was the prior assignment judge um, until Judge Covert took over. And he is now on recall. He retired in 2019 but we are lucky enough to still see him and be before him. And we also have with us the Honorable uh, Judge Cover, who was appointed to the bench in 2005 and began her career in the family part. Um, she was reassigned to the criminal division in 2009 and named presiding judge of the criminal division in 2010. Judge Covert served as the conference chair of the criminal presiding judges from January 2013 to September 2017. And she was also named chair of the Drug Court Advisory Committee in August, 2017. In September of 2018, she was designated presiding judge of the special civil part and was appointed to the special civil part practice committee for the 2018 to 2020 term. In November, 2018, Judge Covert was named presiding judge of the civil part and was named assignment judge of Burlington County in July of 2019. And we also have with us today, um, Jeffrey, APEL, who was a law clerk for the Honorable Victor Friedman and is now a shareholder at Pasternak Appel with offices in Brown Mills and Morristown. He primarily focuses on real estate probate litigation, estate planning, estate administration, mediation, and guardianship. Um, he has been appointed numerous times by the, the Superior Court as a fiduciary, uh, as administrator of contested estates, receiver, and a special fiscal agent. He is like the guru of succession planning. So we're happy to have him with us today. Um, he's also been appointed as attorney trustee for attorneys who have passed away or have been incapacitated. So at this time, I'm gonna turn it over to the, the panel and um, thank everyone very much for their time. Robin, thank you so much. And um, I was going to do some of the introductions, but Robin did that for me. So that is great and we can get started because we have a lot of ground to cover. Um, one of the reasons we put this panel together um, is there's an urgency involved in some of these issues. And what I found when I um, took over as assignment judge uh, was that when an attorney, particularly a solo attorney, and it doesn't have to be, but it generally is, could be someone in a firm uh, who has an active practice and there's just no one to really take over for that attorney when they pass away, that could happen too. But um, that generally speaking, uh, if you haven't made succession plans, you get left in the lurch. And we wanted to get some organization around this. Um, so we thought that it would be a good idea to have this seminar and it really drew in Judge Bookbinder who has so much, uh, a wealth of experience in this area. And Mr. Appel who, um, has assisted many uh, in many uh, the court in many a scenario where um, being left in the lurch is is the operative phrase, unfortunately. And so, what we thought was as a service to our bar, it would be a good idea if we conducted this type of a seminar, so that people who are in solo practices have an awareness. Um, and if you haven't done succession planning for your practice. Uh, that we could walk you through that and we can highlight it and we can make sure that you have a named successor. Um, and so one of the kickoff points of this seminar is to sort of give you the horror stories of what can happen when uh, an attorney doesn't plan ahead. And so this can happen in a variety of ways. It can happen by virtue of sudden death, of course, um, and it can also happen through various incapacities. Uh, you just don't know how you could be incapacitated. It could be physical, it could be mental, it could be substance abuse. There's a variety of ways. 
And this has happened, every one of these. And so I'm going to give you a little background from the vast experience of my two co-panelists and begin with Judge Bookbinder, who can give a little more information about some of the scenarios without naming names um, that have come up around attorneys who find themselves in this position and why it's so important to succession plan. Judge Bookbinder. Yes, so one of the many decisions I did not make uh, was to retire. It was decided by the constitution, so I didn't have to worry about that. Uh, and this is really not about selling your practice uh, or things like that. This is more about emergent types of things. And I know that many of you look at Tom Brady and Phil Mickelson and think nothing's ever going to happen and don't worry, but those are people who were in their 30s and 40s and 50s. And the truth is that things uh, do happen. Now, you may not know, but we've got over a thousand lawyers in Burlington County. And so maybe this only happens three times a year. Uh, so 99.7% is not a problem. It's determined, by the way, not where you live, but where your office is. And there's a rule, and it explains it all in there based upon where your office is. Now, deaths can come, as we know, by a variety of ways. We have had uh, young people die uh, totally unexpectedly, and uh, then we have the situation. Uh, we've, had, we've had, as Judge Covert mentioned, substance abuse, depression, illness. Uh, what we have is we do have a professionalism committee, which right now is chaired by uh, Judge Lihots. So many of the times it starts sort of as a continuum. It's not that uh, anybody from Mount Holly or Trenton is going out there looking for problems, but what happens generally is that a client starts wandering around the courthouse. A client starts coming in to the assignment judge's office or some other judge's office. Uh, an adversary can't find you. Uh, an obituary comes up. Uh, there's a uh, discipline uh, type of situation. So that's how we find out. Uh, and then we have to uh, take action. Uh, the people, again, who go to the professional responsibility, we also have lawyers' assistance, uh, which is in New Brunswick. Uh, and if you know, some of this is designed for you, some of it designed for people you know. That's a lot of times we are first notified by uh, an adversary. And uh, you should turn somebody into lawyers' assistant. It's all confidential. It's through the court system. Uh, and it's uh, very uh, helpful. Sometimes friends of people uh, let us know. And as Judge Covert mentioned, this has happened not just in solos. I've had it a few times in big firms. The difference in uh, big firms is that uh, generally somebody else in the firm takes it over because the real issue of this entire thing is somebody's going to walk into your office. Uh, and the essence of this is whether you're going to choose somebody who's going to walk in the office or the assignment judge is going to choose the person who's going to walk in your office. So just like you should have a will, and just like you want to have an executor or executrix, um, you want to have a successor. Uh, now, let me mention about the executor or executrix. If they're not a lawyer, they're not necessarily going to be running the law practice. And again, we're not out there looking for this. If they can do it in a way that it never comes to our attention, that's fine. But if clients start calling up and saying that uh, nobody's taking care of me, then, then that becomes a, a problem. Uh, I, I can tell you uh, things that have that happened. Basically, if you think about it, uh, generally when you do an estate plan, you're thinking probably of your beneficiary, you're thinking of uh, perhaps your staff, and then uh, at last you if think at all, you think about your clients. When we think about this, it's completely the opposite. The clients are the most important thing. The staff is the second most important thing. And quite honestly, the beneficiaries are not 
that much on our minds. Um, now, what happens is I've had to deal with spouses. Just think about this. Your spouse has probably no idea what's going on in your office. I've had to deal with adult children. I've had to deal with parents. Uh, and it's, it's quite a big uh, shock uh, when, when these things happen. And the essence of what we're trying to talk about is for you to choose somebody uh, that you're comfortable with. Now, if you don't choose somebody that you're comfortable with, then if you end up with somebody like uh, Jeff, again, we have to report this to Trenton. It's a formal public court proceeding. Uh, we have to deal with the client security fund sometimes. I've had situations where I had uh, 15 people in my courtroom yelling at the head of the client security fund. And uh, far be it from me, to uh, say anything uh, negative about clients. Uh, however, I would note that sometimes clients do not have the greatest organization and that's why they came to you in the first place. So whether it's a spouse, whether it's a parent, whether it's an adult child, the client is either gonna have less understanding about what's going on. And they're, they're gonna also have uh, a big interest in what's going on. I've had a case where a client snuck in to the intensive care new unit and tried to get a lawyer to sign papers. Uh, so there's just all kinds of things that can happen. Generally, uh, we, we have, it, it depends upon your practice. We, we generally try and pick somebody. And by the way, when I say we, those days are gone for me. And anything I say here is not binding on Judge Covert but it could happen in this way. And who knows, you may someday get a successor that's not as great as Judge Cooper. So you wanna turn it over to somebody like me? I don't know. Uh, but we try and get somebody who does criminal. Uh, we've had municipal practices. We've had family practices. Sometimes uh, friends uh, step forward, but if they don't, it gets really picked basically upon geography, uh, picked upon a practice area, uh, somebody that I used to think was your friend, who guess what, might not have been your friend. I don't know what goes on behind closed doors. I'm sitting there basically uh, guessing. Uh, the, and there's really two parts to this. Uh, one part is taking care of the clients, but the other part is taking care of the business. Uh, and so I've had cases where I had one person running the business part and had another person uh, running the practice part. So the, the essence of what I'm saying to you is, and, and one of the uh, documents that uh, Mr. Apel gave out, uh, which I find to be very good, uh, was written by somebody named Lloyd Cohen, being prepared for unexpected events. And I would suggest that if you read anything, you read that. Because the essence of this is, you can't plan for everything. And if you don't want the outside coming in, and remember, if somebody like Jeff comes in, they're gonna be very conservative and they're gonna not necessarily be that flexible because they're answerable to Trenton, they're answerable to Mount Holly, they've got to give a report to the court. They're gonna be as conservative as possible, whereas if you pick somebody, particularly if you have a chance to talk to them ahead of time, which quite honestly, it's like everything else. You shouldn't pick uh, an executor or a, a guardian without talking to them, but you ought to really talk it out and talk it through so they know, you know, and it goes, I think, a lot differently than uh, if uh, it's handled through the judiciary. Those are my comments. I return to Judge Coover. Thank you, Judge Bookbinder. Um, really helpful and uh, based on experience. I'm going to have Mr. Appel give the other side of it from the attorney's standpoint, someone who's been appointed as an attorney trustee in several instances, and some of the encounters that you've had, Mr. Appel. Thanks. Yeah, no, the judge gave a really good, uh, uh, more than just an overview of what it looks like 
uh, kind of on the outside. And in this case, the, the courts, as you know, are more uh, reactionary. You know, they'll, they'll have to field phone calls from upset clients uh, or confused clients. And they're scrambling to try to find and keep this practice up and running, if that's a possibility. If the attorney has passed away, it's an entirely different story. But I, I, I put it down like this. What would you imagine one day you're waking up and you were not able to show up for work? You know, who would check your deadline calendar? Who would make calls to reschedule appointments to obtain substitute counsel? Who would let the judge know ahead of time that you can't, um, you can't come to court? Um, in any type of extended absence, who would have the authority to help collect money and pay bills? Those types of things. Um, there is no, it, you know, the concern that a lot of things that Judge Cover and Judge Bookbinder has seen is there's no institutional memory in your firm. If you're solo and you're running the show or your small firm and you're running the show, who else is gonna know these types of things? So when I get in there, I have yet to find a written manual of showing what the office procedures are or what the uh, access to the computer is for the passwords and usernames. Um, and as you can imagine, I'm not going to show you my desk, what a mess it is, but if someone who didn't, if someone had to come in and take over my firm, I'm, I'm fortunate enough that I've got Dan Pasternak or I have others here to help out. If you're on, on your own, you have to think of these types of things. And if you don't, um, it, it, it's a, I wouldn't say it's a catastrophe, but it's pretty darn close to it because as Judge Bookbinder mentioned, um, when I get appointed or anyone gets appointed as an attorney trustee is my goal is to help the clients. And I, all I keep on saying to myself and to my staff is to protect the clients. I'm not there to help out the estate. Now, helping out the clients obviously helps out the estate but my, I'm not wearing my executor hat. I'm wearing my attorney trustee hat to protect these people. So you need to have these types of things written down. You have to have that hard discussion with a friend, attorney of yours to say, listen, you know, I know we've talked about it. You cover for me when I go on vacation. Can we take it to the next level? If something, uh, God forbid, uh, serious were to happen to me. I can tell you some war stories. I'm not gonna give you names. Um, some of the people you, I, I guarantee some of the people in the, the 21 or so people who are here, they've known these people. Um, the hardest ones I find, um, well, I think the sudden death ones are, are quite traumatic for obvious reasons. Um, and the judge appointed me in one where I actually was not, um, uh, I hadn't done this type of work in a, in a while, it was bankruptcy work, but I had enough to be dangerous and I had partners and associates who could do the work. But I was blessed, I was fortunate that this particular attorney who passed away had a very dear friend and she ran in and, and really helped out. And if you have all your files more than seven years old, sitting in a garage, sitting in moldy boxes, um, I, call, I advise you to have some sort of organization of uh, destroying the files while you're alive and well to do it. Otherwise, it becomes your family or it becomes your, uh, or your attorney trustee to do that type of work. It was a literal nightmare of dealing with the storage of all these files. And the, the, the cost of destruction was, um, was immense because this attorney had been around for 40 years. So you do the math there. Um, I, I've seen it, and I'm sure everyone on this uh, Zoom call has seen it, I've seen a lot of uh, uh, depression, uh, and it's difficult to see that. And attorneys have, um, I, I strive, and I know the courts bend over backwards really to, to strive to help out these attorneys who are going through a difficult time in their life and try to get them back up and running. Um, but like Judge Bookbinder said, and I, I know Judge covert feels the same way is we really got to protect the clients and making sure that the attorney is ready to get back and working. Um, 
I have to deal with widows and widow, uh, no widowers yet, but widows. And um, that's very difficult. Uh, and I have found what Judge Hochbinder mentioned very true is that most of the spouses just don't have an inkling of how complex your practice is. And um, even if you've had the discussions at the dinner table, they just don't understand it. And uh, when it comes as an emergency and we're scrambling to keep uh, court appearances and things like that, and, and having to make the de decision for the client, hey, listen, Jeff can't do this because he doesn't handle that type of work. I try to surround myself with people who are much smarter than I and who are much more experienced in those types of practice areas. And that helps out. But if you can do it while you're alive and get those people to protect you and have a kind of a mirrored opportunity and one attorney does it for you and, and you do it for them, that's the way that we, we make the bonds that much stronger and protect the, the clients and protect the bar. Um, what other, uh, it's just, very difficult, very sad situations. Um, and, uh, you know, I've had to go into home offices that uh, were underwater. There's no more, you know, the mortgage is greater than the value. And the office was a mess, literally. And the organization was very difficult. And uh, this particular attorney I'm thinking of was, you know, at the top of his game when he was much younger and just did not have a plan in place and uh, just kind of uh, fizzled away there. Uh, and it was, it was difficult uh, tracking down people. I have found, I will tell you this, I have found the courts to be extremely helpful uh, and understanding when you have these types of situations uh, because they understand, you know, th this is the ultimate. They can, a, a client has no one to protect them right now. So they will generally bend over backwards Opposing counsel, same way. Everyone understands that. So um, it's really the takeaway here is um, really got to think about what would happen if you weren't around for more than just a weekend or more than just a week going on a vacation. Who's going to take over your practice? Now, the final thing I say about this particular section is I realize that I'm talking, I'm preaching to the choir. The 20 people here are more than likely. Uh, really sensitive to this and that's why they're signed up for it. But I encourage you to any of your other uh, friends, anyone else who's willing to listen that they, they think about these types of things and, and get someone to protect them. Um, and it, and it's, a, it's really imperative because I've seen only, I'm getting, I see it getting worse. That's, that's just my experience. I've seen it getting more challenging. Um, so Judge uh, Covert. Before Judge Covert, I want to jump in one thing sure. that Jeff reminded me of. First of all, guess what? Jeff's not working for free. So um, <laughs> what's happened is you, you diminish the estate when you, you pay Jeff. And, and it, it, some of these are very, very time consuming. The other thing is, again, that he mentioned that people don't think about is storage. We got into a whole thing about having to pay for storage of files and talking to Trenton. And there, there's just a lot of aspects to this that if you can work it out with somebody without our oversight, I tend to think it's a lot better for you, Judge Covert. No, thank you, uh, Judge Bookbinder. We talked about this as we prepared for the program and uh, we, we likened it to child custody. You know, do you, wouldn't you want to have that worked out yourselves rather than going to the court as a stranger to your personal family situation? and make those kinds of decisions about it. Um, so if you think about your practice that way, it's, it's the mainstay of your life. And why would you just leave it in the hands of strangers in the event that something should happen even unexpectedly? And it is the case that any file that is less than seven years old has to be maintained. So there are storage costs involved if it comes to that. Um, but I don't wanna stray too far from uh, from the guidance we're hoping to give to everyone. And it is true that for those of you who are here, you're obviously concerned, interested, and will be reactive to this. But we want you to be ambassadors and spread the word um, because the, the, 
the better the messaging goes out, the more organized we can be um, as practitioners and for the sake of the bar. So in order to assist in this endeavor, um, I will be putting together a form that will go out to solo practitioners. Um, I can't send it to every attorney and I don't know if I'll have a list of every possible solo practitioner, but this is my hope. So what we're also going to do is we're gonna put the form into the straight word um, so that everyone can just copy it off and fill it out and return it to the bar and uh, we will also keep that copy there uh, at bar headquarters and also um, the assignment judges chamber. So I'll also have a copy of that. And this will, um, this will help us and you mostly tremendously in terms of knowing who to turn to when bad things happen unexpectedly um, and your practice is left in the lurch. That won't happen if you plan ahead. So at this point, I'm gonna show you, well, I'm gonna have Robin show you and share a screen of uh, something that is actually required uh, as part of the Pennsylvania bar. And each- Can you see that judge? Now we can, yes. Okay. So you can see succession planning is actually part of what I would imagine is their annual you know, CLE that you have to, um, that you have to fill out uh, your, your client security fund annual registration. You would have to include this. Now that, to my knowledge, of course, it's not happening in New Jersey. We've pushed for it in the past, but what we'd like to do is try and introduce this at the local level. And it will look something like this. I, ha I don't have the form completed yet, but um, it will basically ask you to identify in the event of death or incapacity, the person that you would like to oversee your legal practice to protect the interests of clients. And you can see it just has very basic information on there. Um, and that's all we're gonna collect. And um, thank you, Robin. I, I'll certainly get a form out, but that gives you an idea of really um, the basics. Um, Actually, Mr. Ferreira asked if this can, recording can be sent to others. Robin, if we record it and people want it later, can they get it? So we'll we'll put it up on our YouTube channel. They okay. won't be able to get any CLE credits at this point, at like Maybe as an on-demand thing, but but they can we can they can view it on our YouTube channel. That's good. They'll get the information. Yes. So um, as I was saying, I'm gonna get a form out. It'll come through the straight word and I'll do it periodically. So we'll make sure that, you know, if you miss it one time, it's gonna come back. And all you have to do is ask for it. You know, we'll get that form to you or anybody else who needs it. So you can designate who that person would be for your practice. Now, as Judge Bookbinder mentioned, um, you know, you certainly wanna talk to the person ahead of time, make sure that, they're on board with this and that they're not going to get hit up cold if uh, they get a call just double checking and verifying that they're they're going to take over if they take over it never comes to us it's all taken care of and that's what we want um and so we never have to get involved so you you obviously want to pick someone that you trust um but there's certain things i think you should go over with that person i don't need that data and the bar doesn't need that data but I think that you should communicate that with your designee. And that is that they should have the ability to get access to the computer password information. You may not wanna give out your passwords to anybody, but at least give them a way to find that in the event of death or incapacity. Safe combinations, if that is um, applicable to your situation. I would also talk to them about the name and address of your business and trust accounts so that they can access that because that's certainly something you have to report on if you're appointed as an attorney trustee um, and they, they're going to need that information. Um, maybe the name, address, and phone number of your landlord, if that applies, if you're in a rental situation for your business, they may have to get contact with the landlord and you know, it may, you'd be surprised. It may be that people don't really even know who that is. Even your family members sometimes don't know these things. 
Um, the location and access of your closed files. How, how can they get those? And then if it is applicable, uh, name and phone number of an accountant and a state lawyer. So those are just some of the basic um, conversation points you would wanna have with that designee. And then when you fill out the form, as I said, um, the, the bar and assignment judges chambers will only be in possession of the basics. We just need to know who, but that, that who person should, you should have had a conversation about those finer points and what they would need to cover for you. Um, now, this is a resource to the bar and to the court in the event that you die or in, are incapacitated for your practice. It's non-binding, but it certainly is the resource we're looking for. And the reason I say it's non-binding is this. Um, if we so if I appoint an attorney trustee um, for a practice, we have certain obligations. And one of those obligations is that we have to send this up to ethics, uh, state ethics, and run that attorney who's acting as attorney trustee is going to get vetted through the state ethics. What, you know, what if something comes up, uh, you know, that attorney is disqualified as acting on your behalf for some reason, we, you might not know that ahead of time and we wouldn't. So that's the only reason it might be non-binding. There may be certain decisions that have to be made that are contrary to your wishes for, for something like that. But, but other than that, you know, we have every intention of honoring it. And as, as I said, may never even come to that because it doesn't usually come to our attention unless there's a problem. And so um, if you've arranged this ahead of time, uh, then it should go smoothly and it will never even reach the court's doorstep, which is exactly what you want. You just want this to be a seamless transition. So uh, we're gonna help in that regard by uh, reminding you to do this through this form that you're going to fill out. And the reason we need to know about who you've designated is if for some reason it does uh, happen that um, we have to appoint someone, uh, we at least know the starting point for that. Um, but it will also kind of force you to do this um, because we'll be bugging you about it a little bit by virtue of publicizing this, including it in the straight word and getting contact from assignment judges chambers to succession plan. And you can see how important it is. I mean, here's Pennsylvania bar actually including it right in the registration information. Um, I will continue to encourage that at the state level, but it's not up, up to me. So we're gonna do it at the local level. Um, it would help eliminate most of these issues that we've talked about just by virtue of people doing this. Um, so please be ambassadors for that as well as you go out and talk to your friends and colleagues who might find themselves, of course, also in this situation. All right, so that's what we wanna do going forward. And we've talked about, um, and these are ways to protect your practice, protect your families and your loved ones too, because um, I see a few of you on this call who, who I've, who've had the misfortune of me appointing them as attorney trustees, but I am so grateful and I thank you for that service. But you know, you see firsthand um, the, the kind of panic that sets in for family and loved ones. And the, and the um, sometimes families don't all get along with each other. You know, what a surprise. Uh, sisters and brothers start arguing, children come out of the woodwork, and the next thing you know, you're dealing with extended relatives, um, uh, and it's just all can be, un that it is all unnecessary if it can be avoided through this process. Um, so if you were to be appointed as an attorney trustee, uh, we wanted to give you a little bit of an outline of how involved this process can be and why you want to avoid having to go through the court to handle your practice if you die unexpectedly or you find yourself incapacitated. And so if you were appointed an attorney trustee, the court would send you an electronic version of a manual that sort of walks you through and has forms that you can use 
for the process and the court is there to assist and will kind of spoon feed that information. But uh, it isn't simple. And as I said, you have to be run through ethics. We have obligations to send that information out. Um, and so Mr. Appel, I'm gonna have you talk a little bit about what it's like to have to take on that appointment and what are some of the steps that are necessary once you do? Okay, sure. Um, yes, like uh, Judge Covert said, they provide a manual and it's very helpful. Uh, I, I don't want to say that I've been doing this so long, but I remember it before a manual, <laughs> or at least they were just talking about a draft of it. And I was calling Trenton up saying, can you guys give us some guidance here, um, you know, for, for us in the trenches? Fortunately, they have this and it is very helpful. I'm not going to, I know it's part of the materials, the first 100 pages, and I'm not going to go through page by page because um, we only have a total of an hour here. But the, the real important takeaway here is there's different levels of appointment of trustee. There's the regular attorney trustee and the temporary. We don't have to really get into those types of things right now. Um, one is obviously uh, if there's a, a incapacity issue, a mental type of issue, um, and the, the courts are sensitive to that. Um, if, um, and then there's who can make the petition, who can bring it to the court's attention, and that's pretty, uh, pretty broad, fortunately. Um, the courts are real sensitive to that, um, and by the time it really gets to Judge Covert, um, she is more likely than not to already know that there's an issue with this particular attorney. Um, so um, she's gonna be very sensitive and kind of gearing up uh, for what really needs to be done to protect the practice and protect the clients there. The manual um, uh, really then spells out, um, you get that order. Um, Judge Covert's staff are phenomenal. Um, they'll help you out. Uh, you obviously by now we're all very sensitive to um, electronic filing in the e-courts. So if you you or your staff can contact uh, through the e-courts and look up an attorney's name, and they can tell you whether there's any open cases um, in the civil division, special civil part, criminal, and they'll print out a whole sheet for you, or you do it yourself, and it, it is quite helpful. Um, Really, uh, the preliminary steps that I have, and that's spelled out in the manual too, is getting access to the law office. Um, sometimes that you would think, you know, some of those, and I know I see some names here on the, the seminar who have been appointed as administrators and getting access to the person's house sometimes is the hardest part. Uh, getting access to the lawyer's office sometimes. I've had a case where the widow was, how can I say, not very cooperative and did not want to, she, she wanted nothing to do with this, but she wouldn't, she wanted nothing to help me out. And so that's not a very comforting position to be in. Obviously you can always go to the court and the judges will stand by you and help you out any way possible. Uh, but getting access there, checking the calendar or the lawyer's diary, contacting the clerk of the superior court, uh, to can find out any court dates that are coming up. Um, if the person obviously passes away all of a sudden and their practice was active, they may have some court dates, they may have some deadlines, um, statute of limitations, things like that you're gonna have to be aware of. Uh, next step is contacting the clients, reaching out to them. If uh, I've, had, I've had some lawyers who I don't know how they got a hold of their clients. The, the files didn't have telephone numbers. There was no contact information. So it becomes a, a burden on my staff to try to track people down. Uh, so uh, that's important to maintain those files. Contacting the courts, your opposing counsel, I mentioned that before, that needs to be done. And most opposing counsel uh, are more than uh, helpful. An attorney who is very involved with bankruptcy uh, so you have to deal with trustees there. Um, contact one trustee, that whole clique, they all talk to each other, they all help each other out and they'll uh, help you out in that regard. 
Opening and reviewing mail, getting the mail forwarded to you has to be done. Uh, forwarding phone calls, uh, getting access to their, if they're really organized and you have a website um, and the website has a contact portal for clients or potential clients, you're gonna have to get involved in that and get that sent over uh, to you or have your IT person get involved in that. Uh, I joked around before looking for the office procedures manual. Um, I won't embarrass this group of 20 or 21 people, but I don't know how many people have, um, have an office procedures manual. And you can say, well, I have um, my secretary or my, my paralegal knows this. I've had some of the most, I shouldn't say this, most of the support staff that I've dealt with when an attorney has passed away all of a sudden, um, they are phenomenal, they stick around um, and they do what needs to be done, but they're only as good as they are trained or educated. So if the lawyer isn't organized, tend, the staff tend to be not as organized. Um, I guess the exception could be you have that superior staff who is so much better than the lawyer and we all know some of those people. Um, Carolyn Chang brought up a good point there um, about please creating a computer client list of open and active clients, absolutely, and getting access to that. And uh, yes, Susan, you're right. Computer passwords are beyond important, um, having access to those. Uh, inventory the active files and make reasonable efforts to distribute them to clients. That tends to be very time consuming, depending on the size of the practice, but you're obligated to write letters to the, uh, these clients. And I have, you know, there's a form letter in this manual and I have one that I doctored up myself. And um, more likely than not, if the file is five years old or somewhere around there, most of the clients, they don't care about it, but you do have them. And if it's a, if it's a three, uh, four inch thick accordion file, you have an obligation to give that to them. You're able to scan that, that's what I would do, and then give them the paper copy. Um, I secure and review client files, that's really important. Uh, making sure that no blown statute of limitations are, are uh, you don't blow any statute of limitations. And if there's any active files, any closed files, you need a tickler system to remind you of this. You're taking over another practice another lawyer. And if you're not prepared for that, um, it does tend to uh, suck you into that vortex there. Um, the Judge uh, Cover is very uh, uh, um, concerned about giving notice to all potential clients and other attorneys about either the passing of an attorney or the, the, the practice closing down. And so you need to place a newspaper advertisement and the Bar Association is helpful in that regard in either the BCT or some other local paper. Um, and then you have to figure out the storage of files. We talked about that. Um, I happen to have a great landlord where my office is and um, he allows me to store uh, files, uh, not only my files, but I mean, he doesn't care, but other files and I'm keeping them in our, uh, in our basement. And uh, clients sometimes want their files back. Uh, most of, I found, don't want them back, but they, you, you can't, you don't know who that's going to be. And as an important uh, ethics consideration, you can't hold a file uh, hostage if that client owes um, that attorney any money. There is no common law attorney um, file or com attorney law, common law retaining lien. So if that, uh, you have to be, bear that in mind. It's important that you get a receipt from a signed receipt from the client who's picking up the file. So you have a paper trail. Obviously we do that with our own practice, but you have to do that with another attorney's practice. And then your the, the big takeaway here is um, the attorney trust accounts. You have to check to see if there's anything there and their operating account. Um, and anytime you have any issues, you can come uh, write a letter to uh, Trenton 
And I did that on one of my last ones, asking if they had any information about uh, the trust account because I couldn't find anything. And the family was not very helpful. Not that they didn't want to help, but they just didn't know and want to find that information out. Um, you, you should also, you have a right, but not an obligation to take a client's uh, file over uh, if you're able to do that. So if you handle uh, estate uh, litigation and that attorney passes away and you, and, and that was the type of case that that particular attorney was doing, you have a right, but you don't have to take it over. I get that question a lot when people are asking to get involved. Do I have to take over all the files? No, we talked about this before, uh, referring the client to another attorney. Um, and I have found, uh, my attorney friends are more than well willing to help out, particularly if there's a fee involved. But even if not, it, 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 we're all in this together and they, they help out. And if it's just a couple of phone calls or something that I don't feel comfortable with, um, they, they've helped out. And I've, I really commend the bar for doing that. And you obviously have an obligation to protect the client information as you would with any other client. And then the big important thing is uh, uh, finding out that if there's any uh, trust funds that need to be redistributed or returned to the client or turned over. Uh, I haven't had too much of a problem with that because not every practice obviously handles trust accounts. And um, if you find that there's any types of ethic violations or trust fund violations, you're obligated to notify Trenton. And when in doubt, you know, bring that to the court's attention and seek directions and the judge, you know, the courts will help out there. Um, and then the most important thing is issuing your report in a timely fashion to the assignment judge. And um, I stress the timely fashion because uh, judge, judge Covert knows what I'm talking about and also Judge Bookbinder. It's tough, you're supposed to do these, not supposed to, the court rules require you to do these within 120 days of the order of appointment Sometimes it takes time to gather all the information and the courts are understanding in that regard. They want action that either they're getting pressure from either Trenton or more likely from either clients or family members saying what's going on. They wanna keep these files moving. They're interested in what's going on. They need to get some closure on this. So you have to issue a report. And I have found that when I've uh, prepared these reports and you need, you know, seek directions from the judge. They, they've handled this type of thing before and they will help you out. Um, you're working on that really as a team to, to uh, help out the clients, wind down the practice. Uh, and then the judge will indicate what you need to do, either uh, store the files for another seven years or however long, uh, or deal, deal with this particular issue. Um, and if the attorney is not passed away and is just incapacitated, um, notice obviously is given to that particular attorney and the judge is there to make sure that either the practice is ready to go back up and running or there may be other uh, considerations that that particular attorney needs to do, such as uh, get the help that he or she needs, um, get the counseling, that type of thing. So we're all, we're not only you're acting as an attorney in this situation, but you are acting as a mentor. You're acting as a psychiatrist. Um, it's a little bit of everything. Um, and um, it can be daunting at times, but if you have the systems in place and this manual does help you out and checklists in place, um, it, it can be uh, a, a very rewarding uh, situation where you're helping out either wrapping up a particular estate or helping an attorney get to where he or she needs to be, either back in the practice of law or moving on. So judge, that's the that's my Thank two you. cents on the uh, manual. Thank you, Mr. Appel. And that's really helpful from one who knows. Um, and, and I should say, you know, uh, provided there are funds in the practice uh, and or the estate, you are paid for this, it is not free. So hopefully there is their solvency. And uh, if you 
are interested, we are very much interested in recruiting anyone who is willing to serve as an attorney trustee. Um, it's helpful for the court to know that ahead of time. And we would just ask you to submit your name to the Bar Association and your practice areas where you would feel comfortable. So that if the court uh, needs to appoint someone, we have a ready list of attorneys that we can turn to in advance and we're not scrambling and searching the highways and byways, um, we can turn to those individuals for appointment. And as I said, um, as long as there's some solvency, you know, you're gonna get um, reimbursed through regular fee service for this. Um, so by all means, please let Robin uh, Goldenberg know at the bar if you're interested in being an attorney trustee and we'll keep those names on file. That said though, um, I wanna return to our focal point, which is to protect your own practice and make sure that you have talked to someone and they can be the designee for your practice and you'll never have to rise to this level of court involvement. That's a way to avoid it all. Um, so because we don't have too much time left, I do want to um, give the opportunity to Judge Bookbinder uh, to talk a little bit about outside resources. And Mr. Appel had submitted some information also. Um, at Robin, did you want to wait to give the code till after we're done with that section? I did. There was just a question, so I didn't know if you wanted to take that uh, now. What was or. the question? It, yeah. it came directly to me. Um, if, you're, if your law practice successor is not your executor, how will they get access to things like your bank accounts and your trust accounts and stuff like that? I, it's usually not your executor. Uh, at least, well, I don't, I should say Judge Bookman or Mr. Appel may have more experience in that regard, but it's, you get, you give it to them. You know, you have to give them that kind of an access, but do you guys want to hop in on that question too? Hop and First of all, you have a power of attorney. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's the best thing. Uh, again, the whole thing we're trying to talk about is not going through us. Right. Uh, avoiding that. Avoiding us is and in basically a power of attorney. So I defer to Jeff. Well, it, if if you are involved in the court system um, and there is a court order, the court order gives the uh, attorney trustee access to trust and operating account. I mean, that's the practical answer there. And banks have, you know, I've never had any issues with the banks there. But I, what my issue is, and what my problem is, is finding out where they do their banking. I mean, it, it's just, I guess I've seen some horror stories where there's just no records of it, or they just sh shut down their shop and they just weren't maintaining it, which scares me intensely. But you don't have, you're, you're, Judge Coburn's right, it's very rare that the executor is the same as, um, as, you, as your attorney trustee. Just, this doesn't happen in my experience. Yeah, I mean, a power of attorney is obviously for somebody who's alive as opposed when, once uh, you die, your power of attorney, die, attorney dies with you. I, I would say also uh, that uh, a couple other things out there, as Judge Covert mentioned, resources, just Google attorney succession planning. And the American Bar Association has all kinds of stuff there. Uh, I've had cases where I've had people that, were incapacitated and basically I negotiated with them. They got to pick the person. And if it was a person I thought was okay, that was fine and they gave up and then that was the end of that. Uh, also a big thing is the staff. The staff, really, again, there's no, not necessarily money coming in, not necessarily all the staff's gonna be able to stay. So you've gotta figure out what you're gonna do with reference to the staff. And finally, uh, talking about negotiating with the uh, beneficiaries, try and negotiate the valuation of a personal injury case. Forget about your client. Now, all of a sudden, the beneficiary, they have their views of what this case is worth. And it just, it just gets way, way, way out of control. So the more you can do yourselves, the better off this is. Mr. Appel, some of the, thank you, Judge Bookbinder. What are some of the resources that you um, referenced? Yeah, if you take a look at, um, there's 126 pages, so you don't have to look at all. But page 109, write this down. Page 111, 
and page 113. Though, if you take a look at the Dropbox that was uh, given to you the other day of all that, those are the beginning pages of each of the three articles. Uh, some of them that Judge Bookbinder referenced. One was how to survive and thrive as a small or solo practitioner. One is the ethics checklists. And the other one that uh, Judge Bookbinder mentioned specifically is being prepared for unexpected events. That's a article. Couple, these are a couple of years old. I gave this seminar or part of the seminar back in 2013. So I had some of these articles, nothing's really changed. So it's just being uh, prepared for these type of things. And the only other takeaway is um, if you write these letters down, D, capital E, capital E, K, I, they stand for define your support network. So you identif identify all your potential helpers, lawyers and non-lawyers that would help you out. That's for the D. The second letter is E, as in enable. Enable your support network with an institutional memory. Collecting and organizing an emergency casualty manual. The next E is empower. Empower your helpers. Documents to give your helpers the authority, understanding, and direction. The next, next letter is keep, a K as in keep. Keep your information safe and available. And the last one is I, inform. Inform others of your plan. Let them know of his, his excuse me, of his existence. Doesn't matter if you've typed this up and you keep it in the inside of your computer where no one has access, it has to be available and they have to know how to get to it. That's my takeaway on those principles of being prepared. Thank you, Mr. Powell. So in closing, I would simply emphasize this. Um, we hope that we've been able to provide some kind of service for you today in giving you this information. It may not have been at the forefront of your minds, but hopefully it is now, and that you will take the steps necessary to do your own succession planning. And uh, we'll keep those records so that there's, we have that resource and there's no mistaking who you would like to handle it. But be aware that if you do your own succession planning, we fully anticipate we're never going to need to access that. It's going to happen smoothly on its own. And I'm going to help uh, to assist in that regard by getting these forms out to you. Keep an eye out in the straight word for that opportunity. Um, in addition, we hope that some of you will um, quickly respond to requests to act as volunteers to be appointed as attorney trustees. Where states are solvent, you will be paid. Um, and so it is an opportunity also, and simply let the bar know that. If we've accomplished those two purposes, we will be very pleased with today's presentation. Um, we really uh, want to support our solo practitioners and all of our attorneys to make sure that they don't find themselves in a scenario that they really never thought about. And that it would really put others that they care about in some kind of jeopardy. So we thank you so much for your time and attention here today. We hope we've been of some assistance. And if you have any further questions, please reach out and we'll try and answer those as well.